Okay, so it's the top of the hour. So we're going to go ahead and get started with today's panel discussion. I would like to welcome everyone to our discussion, Solving for Sleep, Addressing Insomnia in Health Centers, Getting Real About What Impacts Our Patients' Sleep. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I, I'm excited to introduce you to our series um, and myself. My name is Andrew Phillip. I'm the Senior Director for Clinical and Population Health here at the Primary Care Development Corporation based in New York City. Uh, and next slide, if this is your first time joining us, uh, PCDC is a national nonprofit dedicated to really um, building health equity and enhancing care in primary care broadly, including areas like behavioral health. We do this through advocacy, through capital investment, and through practice transformation in the form of coaching, consultation, and technical assistance. And we're excited to be part of this discussion today. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, our discussion today is really um, um, much thanks to SAMHSA and uh, the SAMHSA Center of Excellence for uh, Integrated Health Solutions. Uh, however, it's important to note that um, the discussion from both myself and our esteemed panelists today um, does not necessarily reflect the views of SAMHSA, uh, CMHS, uh, Health and Human Services, or any other uh, federal uh, government entity, uh, simply that of ourselves and our, our, our uh, panelists here. Next slide. Uh, so, um, you know, if you joined us last year, uh, we had um, a, a really fruitful discussion over the course of about a year looking at how integrated teams can address diabetes. And this year, we're really focusing on sleep. And so um, today is really the start of a long-term discussion on how can we leverage the power of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams to really continue to improve the experience of the healthcare for our patients, our communities, and also our healthcare providers um, while doing this efficient, efficiently and, and improving outcomes in the process. Next slide, please. So uh, as I mentioned, this is part of a series. Uh, today is, is actually uh, a precursor to the, the formal launch of a webinar series. And so we're talking about FQH, or about health centers broadly today. Um, but in starting in December and actually every month thereafter, we'll be hosting a virtual conversation that really focuses on a different but uh, interrelated aspect of sleep health. And so you'll see on the screen here, topics will range from everything from kind of sleep 101, introductions to sleep and how sleep is relevant right now amidst COVID and amidst other things, to um, hearing from people who are living with their own sleep difficulties, uh, um, as well as family members and others with lived experience. We're gonna be focusing on health disparities and building health equity throughout, but especially um, we'll have one session really explicitly dedicated to that. We're going to talk about both behavioral and medical interventions, including assessments um, and screening for um, sleep health. And then we'll be ending the series in 2021 with a, with a discussion really specifically for us as healthcare providers and looking at our own sleep and how we can really um, practice what we preach, but also um, feel better and do better while we're doing good. Um, so uh, next slide, please. And by the way, folks can uh, register for this the same way you register for the series at PCDC dot org slash uh, sleep conveniently. Um, but we're really talking about sleep today and I'm going to introduce our panelists in just a moment. But, you know, sleep is a key issue right now and we're going to hear about why. But I will argue today and throughout our entire series that sleep and sleep health, including insomnia, is really a key area to bring integrated care teams together. Um, when we're talking about integrating primary care and behavioral health especially, uh, this is a prime opportunity to really um, address something that underscores uh, a vast majority of physical health as well as behavioral health conditions that our patients and, and communities are facing. So it's a prime opportunity and something that we're not talking about enough, I would argue. So I'd like to introduce our panelists today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so Camille Evans, uh, LMSW, has dedicated her career to improving the care provided and also providing support uh, to those that are at times invisible and forgotten. Through multiple roles within healthcare, Camille has worked to provide holistic and inclusive care for all members of the community. And currently she works as the social services manager and behavioral health consultant for Valor Health, a small health system and a critical access hospital uh, with outpatient clinics in Emmett, Idaho. 
Uh, also joining us is Dr. Julita Mir. She is an internist and infectious disease physician with a passion for community health and serving uh, vulnerable populations. She has over an 18 year career working as a clinician in Boston's federally qualified health centers and managing HIV and hepatitis programs. Um, she has also held many leadership positions, including currently being the chief medical officer or including having been the chief medical officer for Dot House Health. And she's currently the chief medical officer at Community Care Cooperative, or C3, uh, as uh, folks in Massachusetts are likely aware. And finally, uh, we're pleased to have uh, Lee Rechick joining us today, uh, LCSW CCS ACS. He's currently the Director of Behavioral Health at the Henry J. Austin Health Center. Uh, Lee brings extensive experience working directly with both mental health and substance use uh, um, seeking clients in nonprofit and, and private practice settings. He's actually taught undergraduate addiction courses as an adjunct professor and mentored social work students. Uh, Lee's been a licensed clinical social worker for the past 30 years and worked with underserved populations throughout his career. In his spare time, he enjoys reading, riding his motorcycle and photography. Uh, so that's our panel. Uh, and I'd love to uh, also invite the audience. Uh, I've been seeing some activity in the chat here. And we'd love, as we go through, to hear from you, to hear your thoughts, your comments, and also your experiences as we go through. Um, this is designed to be an informal discussion. And to start with, I'd love that folks could chime in the name of your organization and where you're dialing in from today. And as we're getting a sense of that, um, panelists, I'd like to hear from you. Um, tell us a little bit about, about your health centers and, and really what, what's important to the work that you're doing right now. Uh, um, Camille, would you like to start us off? Sure. So um, I am in Emmett, Idaho, um, which is about 25, 30 miles from Boise. And um, Emmett is a community of, um, Emmett itself is about eight to 9,000 people in the surrounding area. Um, about 15,000 that we serve, um, and so close to an urban area, but kind of rural care. Um, we are RHC, and um, I um, we have a critical access hospital that's attached, and then our primary care clinic and specialty clinics. And I have been with Valor for about three years, um, and have been working on the integrated behavioral health program and patient-centered medical home for um, the last year and a half of that. Um, and so the patients that we see in primary care, you know, is kind of the whole array from pregnant moms to newborn babies to end of life and everything in between. And um, and I um, also kind of just see all of those, those patients, everything, um, all kinds of different needs. So, that's about it. Great, thanks. Uh, uh, Dr. Mir. Um, good afternoon, everyone. A, a pleasure being here. Um, this is certainly an important topic um, in the middle of this uh, pandemic and here in the Northeast as our numbers go up, uh, we're gonna continue to see more. But um, so quickly, in, in my particular practice, um, I work in a federally qualified health center in Boston, and we have, um, like all health centers, a diverse patient population. That particular setting has about a 30% of Vietnamese patients and about a 30% of Latino patients and about 15% of um, African-Americans and then other groups. So one of the things that, that I'm sure will come up today is like the cultural differences when you talk about uh, sleep and when you describe your sleep problems and how do you address those. In my role as a chief medical officer of C3, which is uh, an accountable care organization in Massachusetts, we have 18 federally qualified health centers and we serve about 140,000 Medicaid members. So in that network, we have a lot of geographic demographic differences. So hopefully we'll be able to um, bring some of that here today. And, and Lee. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I work for Henry J. Austin, uh, which is a federally qualified health center in Trenton, New Jersey. It is a very urban community uh, with 30% uh, Spanish speaking and um, the balance African-American patients. Uh, we have been um, 
we are certified for uh, patient-centered medical home as well as a joint commission. And uh, we've been doing integrated care. So it's a community health center. And what we've done is, is we've infused behavioral health into the community health center. We've been practicing that way probably for the past six years. So um, behavioral health is tied extremely closely to all of the medical care and our part of um, the way we practice. And what we've identified is, is that sleep is typically one of those areas where patients are able to identify uh, that they may be having problems. Whereas when we talk about other uh, mental health issues, whether it's depression or um, anxiety, um, sometimes they're not familiar with those terms or they normalize them. But when it comes to sleep, people really are able to talk about the different difficulties that they have with it. So we find it a widespread problem throughout our population. And, and I appreciate that. And I think that's that's a good kind of entree into, into where we're going. And I'm, I'm curious, uh, Camille, is that, do you see sleep also as a widespread issue in your population? I mean, um, kind of, you know, as you're joining us today, why is sleep important enough to talk about and to, and to kind of bring you into this discussion? Yeah, I definitely think that it's a widespread issue. It is, um, so with every patient I meet, it's a question that I ask. And um, I think one of the things that I find, though, is that people tend to just think, it, I'm just, I just don't sleep. Um, and so it isn't something that they always bring up with their provider. Um, when asked, they can definitely say, yeah, it's a problem for me, and this is kind of my experience and the challenges that I have. Um, but I, I think that many times they're not even bringing it up because they They've just kind of gotten used to the fact that they don't sleep and kind of just discounted as something that needs to be addressed. Um, it's probably causing a lot of the issues that they may be coming to or could be a contributor to those issues, but they don't necessarily see it as something that, that they can have some ability to, to have any impact on. Yeah, I think that, that, that's, that's a good point, right? It, on the one hand, sleep is, is like, uh, so common, it's everywhere. And on the other hand, maybe we're not talking about it so much because it is so common, it's everywhere. Um, Dr. Mir, is this, does this come, is this kind of your experience as well in, in this? Sorry, um, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, we, I don't think we do a great job in our medical education, in our, you know, NP schools, uh, training primary care clinicians to really understand and, and know how to assess sleep. So I think, you know, you come to me with a sleep problem and also chest pain, and I'm sure I'm going to turn to the chest pain and dismiss your sleep problem. And maybe your chest pain is caused by your poor sleep. But I just don't have the expertise, and you know I've been in practice for 20 years, um, and I don't feel like I'm skilled. But the reality is that when patients bring sleeping difficulties, there's something behind it. And what I think we we don't do a good job is the if the patient elicits a sleep problem, I'd say the immediate response from the average primary care provider, and and I know it's very dangerous to to generalize, is going to be something like. Are you depressed? Do you have anxiety? And that the patient just, you know, gets quickly defensive. Like, no, I just have sleep problems. Why are you now thinking I have a mental health problem? So th that doesn't, it's not a great opener, <laughs> conversation opener when you want to understand what's behind. And then what I alluded earlier, what, what I find that I'm even less skilled is understanding how to approach you know, a Vietnamese patient who's talking about sleep disturbances, and then a Latino woman who's talking about not being able to sleep. And um, sort of even though I've worked with those groups, <clears throat> there's probably a mastery on how do you approach it um, differently with each um, group. Um, and it's something I don't think we get taught in, in school. So, so for us, we've approached it a little bit differently because um, as part of our behavioral health screening questionnaire that we do in the very beginning of every visit at primary care, we've included um, question, the PHQ-2, the GAD-2, 
a question about alcohol use, drug use, and then the short for the insomnia severity index. So that opens for us a discussion um, and every patient gets it at every visit. So there are many things that can occur between visits, which may impact people at different points, which is why we ask it at every visit. But the patients come to expect and it's become normalized as part of their visit. And then it allows the behavioral health and the primary care teams to start to have discussions um, about all the various things that may be impacting their health. Yeah, I, th I think the like coming up with it with an organized way to really screen for uh, the presence of sleep conditions along with everything else is, is definitely, I think, something that we're looking to move towards probably as a group, I think, for a lot of us in the room. Um, but I think also that, that um, you know, the point that uh, Dr. Mir mentioned also about, about, you know, certain populations and, and kind of if we look at diversity within our, within our clients, um, Camille, earlier you were talking about, you know, seeing everyone from, uh, um, uh, pregnant moms to people who are kind of at, at the at the later stages of life. Are there certain populations that you've seen that seem to be struggling or, or whether they're aware of it or not with sleep health more than others? Um, I don't know if I would say that one particular population or age group um, experiences it more than others, but I think there are different things that impact mm -hmm. the issues. So um, I didn't really talk about the, um, our um, population is pretty, um, not super diverse, mostly white, um, but we do have a pretty large um, Hispanic Latino population. So, you know, with, that's pretty much what our demographics look like. Um, and I don't know that I could identify a difference as far as that goes, but as far as age groups, um, I have definitely seen a huge increase of kids that um, are staying up super late and then sleeping all day. Um, it's a issue that's happened in my own house. Um, and so I know firsthand how, you know, all of a sudden they're not in school anymore and it's like, you know, it's like the never ending summer vacation. Um, so having to figure, you know, help, help the, patients and families kind of know how to navigate that. Um, I think that kind of the more middle-aged um, group, you know, it's a, it's a lot of different things. It's anxiety and depression, those things that we would see. It's just kind of some lifestyle choices or it's, you know, family and kids and just kind of getting into um, just having those issues, you know, from the time that you have kids and um, the challenges that come with that. With the pandemic, I have seen a lot of people that just are completely out of their routine. And so that complete change of routine has just kind of thrown them for a loop and messed their sleep up significantly. Um, as we move kind of down the spectrum to um, the older ages, um, a lot of pain-related issues. Um, in addition to all the other stuff, but, you know, really starting to see that as a huge contributor to their lack of sleep, um, the number of, you know, people that are in their 80s that sleep in a recliner and not a bed anymore, and all of, you know, those kinds of issues that contribute to the lack of sleep. Yeah, that, I think things like that connection to pain are exactly why, again, for, like for integrated care, there's so, there's so many connections and kind of fingerlings that reach out from sleep that we're also working with our clients and patients on. Um, but you also mentioned the, the pandemic and uh, there was a, an article recently came out, or a few things have been highlighted even by the American Medical Association where they kind of talk about the idea of uh, corona somnia and, you know, like sort, sort of um, sleep difficulties amidst the pandemic. Um, curious, um, you know, Dr. Mir, you have access to um, you know a lot of health centers. Uh, you're, uh, you're, you know, in this in with C3. Yep. Are you seeing actual differences amidst the pandemic in, in sleep health or other things that are related? What does that look like? No, absolutely, and and you know we've seen certainly an increase. You know, as Camille was saying, with the changes of routine, I think the populations where we've seen the the most change have been on patients with serious mental illness that suddenly there's a change of their caregiver's routine. You know, their VNA no longer comes, their health workers not showing up. 
Um, so there's more social isolation. Individuals who were engaged in substance use disorders, you know, in medication assisted treatment clinics, and they were coming weekly, you know, that touch point with the nurse to, even if it was just to check on pill counts or urine tox screens, it was their social connection. And we're seeing more overdoses, you know, across the country. So I think those particular groups that, um, that are hurting in the geriatric world, we see a lot of individuals who they feel so vulnerable, they don't wanna leave the home, therefore they're behind on their diabetes care, their you know, blood tests, their screening. So that creates all these anxiety because they're, they really wanna stay on top of it, but they can't, you know, particularly around flu shot. We hear it every day, people saying, I'd love to do my visit the uh, video because I don't wanna come in, but I need my flu shot, how do I do that? Um, so, you know, it's, it's the struggle of making the day-to-day -day decisions on what's best for your life and not having a lot of support around because some of your support system's gone or not in front of you anymore. So I think that's sort of what we're seeing. I'd be curious about, you know, especially in a highly urban area, you know, I see you nodding your head there. What's, what's been the experience there? Have things been, what have you seen differently amidst the pandemic? I think you're on, you're on mute there. I agree with Dr. Mir that part of the challenge is, is that everybody's routine has been totally disrupted as far as their health care is concerned. You know, within our community, um, the health center is kind of this safe place for people to come and they're used to coming there. They get their medicines there. We have an in, in-house in pharmacy. They're used to coming to get their lab work there. So this safe place is now totally shifted as far as their processes and procedures and their ability to have access to all their caretakers. Um, so again, with the MAT, that's been a very difficult population. They don't have access to their counselors. So I agree with everything Dr. Mir said, but I think one of, on top of the pandemic is also the overall level of social unrest and racial disparities and um, justice total, um, uncertainness um, in our overall environment coupled with the pandemic has just made it um, just more difficult for people, uh, a lot more trauma, a lot more um, just un overall unsafe environment, just multiply times three based on everything that's going on. So I, I think that has a significant impact. People don't feel safe for a variety of reasons, uh, whether it's not safe to go out. Their safe places are no longer there. Um, there's racial unrest, so it's not safe in the community. So there's just layers upon layers of unpredictability and um, with no end in sight and with no stability um, available to them. Yeah, I think that, I'm, I'm glad that you're bringing that up, but particularly around, um, you know, racial inequity and the impact of racism in society, um, and also the general sort of unrest and tension that I think, regardless of what area of the country we're in, um, has been um, immense. And actually, later in our in our series that'll be coming up, will be work, one of a, one of a researcher who actually does research specifically around the intersection of sleep health and racial disparities. Will be presenting some emerging research that she's doing and finding things just like that, where um, particularly for adolescents, the actual experience of stress related to discrimination. Um, is impacted and, and sort of moderated actually by sleep, and this is a key area. But um, you know, uh, curious. Uh, you know, any other perspectives? Um, you know, um, Polita or, or Camille, as far as you know, what you're seeing now. Um, if, if there is anything different lately, and and if there's anything that's getting in the way um, yeah. of addressing sleep. Well, I, I wanted to make sure we don't underestimate, and you know, folks on this call will hopefully, or maybe not, relate. But it's our own <laughs> problem sleeping as healthcare workers, right? And um, there's been several articles in this pandemic looking at healthcare workers, you know, be a frontline nurse, a community health workers, a therapist, you know, a physician. And I think the article I remember, there's one that sort of looked at 13 
articles recently published, indeed an average, in, a, in, in average, in all those healthcare worker studies, there was about a 38% increase in sleeping disorders among healthcare workers. And then there was about a 22% increase in you know, depression and about 20% or a little less on anxiety. So if you can imagine these patients who are now even more vulnerable are taken care by somebody who's not sleeping well either. So clearly my empathy and my tolerance and my <laughs> smiliness might be decreased if, if I'm going through my own issues. So I think acknowledging that healthcare workers are also um, suffering from sleep disturbances like everybody else is, is super important in my mind. Yeah, and I think, um... Yeah, there's this, the, the interrelationships, uh, both in terms of ourselves and our sort of like tension and then how we attribute what's going on with our patients, right? We you know that's huge. And one of the, um, someone in our audience um, shared earlier about, about obstructive sleep apnea and pulmonary conditions. And, you know, you think about that in, in terms of what's going on right now and access, right? People coming in who need to come in for their sleep studies, but then also, you know, we sort of, you know, as a clinician, I know from my own experiences in primary care, I'm being frustrated, you know, because we, I, people would come in and, you know, they've been given a CPAP or, you know, a, a, an airway pressure device to help them with their sleep apnea and breathing, and they're just not using it. Um, and as we pull back those layers, we see there's things like housing instability or they're getting away. If you can't plug in your CPAP, how are you supposed to be compliant with it? And I'm curious, what have you seen around, like, has access to um, like those sleep related medicine um, services changed or been different at all um, in, in your in your clinics? Um, I will start. Um, I I think access has been an issue. Um, being able to you know even for quite a while a lot of those providers weren't providing services, um, but I have had a number of patients that have been prescribed a CPAP or um, BiPAP or you know, different things and they, they do the sleep study, they get those devices and they never use them because the, the psychological issues that they're dealing with in relation to them are not being addressed. So they may have some trauma or you know, other issues that prevent them from being able to successfully use those devices. And so then they come into their provider and their provider just tells them, you need to use it. Um, and so really needing to explore the, the why behind them not being successful, I think is very important. And I would love someday to see it be more proactive that when someone is prescribed or sent for sleep studies that there's more um, behavioral interventions that are provided to help it be successful from the very beginning. And I, I was going to say, as you're talking, you know, I've had several patients who I've said, you know, you need to isolate yourself. And they look at me like, and isolate myself with my CPAP machine. Uh, how do you do that? Um, uh, you know, it's, uh, so, so it is hard, you know, as we're talking about sleeping habits and, and routines, no one has the same routines anymore. No one has the same space anymore. So, so our, our um, recommendations for patients need to be realistic and need to be doable, right? Because um, otherwise people just don't feel helped. Yeah, because I, I think a lot of it's priority based, uh, just as you guys had mentioned, is, is that I have to have a safe place to live I have to have food and I have to make sure my kids are going to school, um, which is a tall order for a lot of our patients. So when it comes to some of these sleep aids and sleep devices, um, when it comes to anything that's additional, it's just not within their ability to be able to manage the additional things due to the level of stress and challenges that currently exist. Yeah, and I think those. So I'm, you know, I'm curious if, if there's other kind of scenarios that have been coming up where, um, you know, you're working with with your patient populations to really um, try to overcome these barriers, um, whether it's accessing uh, like traditional services, but also, you know, for example, one of the one of the attendees mentioned in here utilizing uh, CPAPs that have some portable component like batteries. Um, 
you know, is there anything where you see opportunities where, you know, we can do something to mitigate some of these, uh, some of these circumstances that just make it harder to address sleep, either for ourselves or for our patients? One of the things that I wanted to say is I think that it's important for people to understand that there are very few things that are just going to automatically fix sleep issues, that it's something that takes time. And helping patients to be able to understand that and have some patience and some um, tolerance for being able to experiment with different things and give it time. Um, but it takes conversation and kind of helping them problem solve and come up with some of those solutions. Um, that you know can can start to make a change, but sleep, you know, it, a lot of this stuff is not is not like a magical cure that you can just all of a sudden they're sleeping seven eight hours and everything's you know going well. You have to kind of work towards that. Yeah, you know, I think that like working towards a program of so sleep and, and sort of being realistic with the system is interesting. And, and one of the um, one of our attendees posted a question that um, somewhat provocative. I think it, it really, especially since um, you know, I think all of you are, are also in management roles of, of teams. Um, you know, a point was made that um, you know our own culture of healthcare is somewhat toxic when it comes to sleep. Um, you know, really pushing um, long hours. Um, when you think about like medical residency and med school programs, graduate school training programs, um, you know, that, that sleep is often kind of not the focus. Um, and it feels like there's a little we can do to change these systems that, that put healthcare workers sleep as last priority. Curious, how do you address wellness and, and sleep with, with staff? Is this something that you see? Is this match your own experience? I, I can say what we've been doing both at the health center where I practice and, and most of the other health centers, I would say here in Massachusetts, everybody's making, you know, management's making um, really an effort to think about wellness. And, you know, of course, started in March with the emergency declaration and, and everybody being sent home and working remote and no longer having, you know, seeing each other in the same workplace. So it's gone from creating opportunities for people to be together and still discussing cases and, and discussing work-related issues to just having opportunities to do social um, um, activities or many places have put together like, you know, online yoga classes, virtual meditations, tips of the day. Um, I think there's, there's a variety of how helpful that is and how many people can actually take a break from work um, or even mentally feel like this, uh, they can do it. But, uh, but I, I've seen a lot of our health centers really worry about the mental health of their, of their staff. And, you know, we've seen a lot of people taking FMLA because the kids are home or because they had a, they have an elderly person. So that's affected, of course, staffing at the health centers. And then, you know, as winter comes, uh, we're really worried about you know, the ability to do all the things we're supposed to be doing. Any other experiences? Does this, is, does this map what's, what things are looking like in, in Idaho as well? Our staff, um, any talk about just their own energy levels? And, um, you know, I know also we've been talking a lot in the last few years about burnout as well. Um, do, you, do you have that feeling there as well? Um, yeah, I definitely see an impact on staff. I think our experience has been a little bit different in Idaho. Um, there was that initial, everything has to change, we have to do everything different, and then nothing really happened because we didn't have that, um, a, you know, that initial spike. And the um, initially, our cases were fairly low, and so that's also created in addition to just the political atmosphere, this mentality of um, we're over this, I'm not even gonna acknowledge that there's coronavirus is still an issue. Um, and so um, there is a lot of contention and it's just relentless. And I think that we feel that in interactions with our patients, we feel that when we go to the grocery store, we feel it when we go home and you know, even when you try to limit your news, 
you know, it's it's just everywhere. It is so everything that we're experiencing is so relentless that it's hard to just even get any break from it. So um, I agree with the, what Dr. Mira is saying is that it's really important that we are focusing on employee wellness, but it's very challenging to be able to do that and to know um, how to really make an impact um, because there's you know, now that we are seeing more of a spike here in Idaho, um, you have a portion, you have the healthcare, most of the healthcare population that's starting to, have to deal with this on a regular basis, and then you have a portion of the community that just is completely not wanting to even acknowledge that it's happening and fighting against it. And, um, and so that's a hard place to be as a healthcare provider that's, you know, having to go to work every day and take care of these patients and then live in a community that's not really supporting what they're doing every day and the challenges that they're facing. Um, and so I think that that does, I've heard a number of people, um, coworkers that, you know, wake up at two o'clock in the morning and can't go back to sleep and there's just so much coming at us all the time. Um, it's definitely taking a toll. And, and so we can add, um, Camille, to what you said, there was um, an article I saw, I think was published last month, that um, sort of reminded me of two things that I sort of didn't link to insomnia. One is that the change of routine now we've, you know, we've changed the time we wake up, we change the time we go to bed, because now we're working from home, we change our lunch time, we exercise at a different hour, and that certainly has, um, you know, changes our internal cycle of sleep wake pattern and the study demonstrates how you know people who had very clear sleep patterns and wake and sleep times it gets all changed because their routines have changed and then the other thing is the fact that we're more indoors there's less commuting there's less social interactions outside and therefore people are less exposed to light um so, you know, I thought those two things are, are super interesting. I saw Andrew on the chat, a comment about, um, you know, people saying, you know, what can we do if even our school systems um, are proud to put more and more work on, on um, residency, um, you know, and residents on, on students in general. And I think I would say, I think, we live in a culture that people are proud to say they're very busy. We all are, you know, I say that too. And I think we have to stop saying we're so busy and that we're happy we're so busy. And I think, um, you know, it starts with us trying to, uh, I think, figure out, make sure we're not proud of being busy and not sleeping uh, because that makes us look, you know, effective or um, important in some way. So I, I think for, um, for us, in behavioral health, the challenge is, I, this is the first time that I'm aware of that all of the clinicians are living the same experience as the patients and have to treat them. You know, usually if somebody has had a very similar experience, they can pass the patient on to somebody because it may be very difficult for them. But I think this is a very um, unique experience for behavioral health because they are living in the pandemic. They're doing the very same things that their clients are doing. And then they're having to figure out how to service their clients, take care of themselves and survive what's going on. So um, I think it's a huge challenge for um, behavioral health in that same way. And then I think for our patients, I think we have a little bit of an advantage working in an integrated setting because we're doing screenings for all of those behavioral health types of things um, in addition to the sleep. So it marries all of them and allows us to have a robust discussion with the patients um, to normalize what they're experiencing. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit more about that and specifically how we're using our teams and integrated care teams to address sleep. Um, and, and Lee, you had earlier mentioned, and there was actually a question about um, the screener that you use. What does that process actually look like? If I'm a, if I'm a primary care physician and I identify a sleep need, um, can you talk about like how you actually sort of make that transition? Who sort of um, owns that interaction and what that looks like? Sure. So the way the way that we've worked it in our health center 
is um, we do uh, the pre-assessment, which is basically, it's not a lot of questions. We're not doing the full insomnia screening that's left to behavioral health. So the MA, it's done electronically. They ask uh, the PHQ2, the GAD2, and three questions related to sleep and the alcohol and substance um, at the time, along with their blood pressure and various screens that they do when they um, come in for the center. And then once they test positive for any of those areas, then a order is sent to behavioral health and behavioral health then comes in and we'll do the full screening for the patients and then have those discussions. So it's in conjunction with the medical team. The medical team may identify something during the visit or it can come up in the pre-screener. Um, but once those things are identified, then it's brought to the team and the team is gonna work on it with the patient to figure out the best solution, medical, behavioral combination of both. And uh, curious to hear from our other panelists, kind of what that, what the role of different team members tends to look like when we're talking about sleep health and kind of how you bring people together. So um, I had mentioned before that the behavioral health program here is fairly new um, in the last year, year and a half. So we're still developing a lot of that. Um, I would love to see the questions Lee, that you have that you're asking. Um, we do the PHQ2 and the two GAD questions, but that's pretty new even for our group. Um, so a lot of it is my involvement is um, more physician driven. So identifying an issue. So usually I'm going in and there's a different issue that's been identified. Pretty rarely is it actually sleep that was identified as the issue. It was other things. And then as I ask the questions, um, sleep comes up as an issue a good portion of the time. And um, but this, one of the things I find interesting is that when I ask patients and we kind of talk about all of the things that they're struggling with and I ask them what they would like to focus on right now, not very often is it actually sleep that they pick. Um, and so many times I'm having to kind of guide the importance of that and helping them understand the impact that sleep can have on all of those things that may be the primary concern that they want to discuss or you know, work on at the time. So as far as the integrated team, it's mostly um, you know, just behavioral health. We do have a chronic care manager um, that works with our diabetic, diabetic patients and some um, heart failure, but um, I don't know how much she's actually she's doing when it comes to sleep, addressing sleep or assessing for sleep. So we're still kind of in the beginning stages of figuring out how to be a team. And some positions do it better than others. Dr. Mayor, curious if, uh, you know, again, kind of looking out at a number of health centers, um, similar, like, is, is there that variability there? Are there certain areas that you see as opportunities for teams to really, um, like, interdisciplinary teams to come together and look at sleep? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it's super interesting what, you know, the approach that Lee has, you know, uh, about screening and normalizing. We, we have tremendous, you know, I, I have to acknowledge, it's really hard to get care teams to want to do more and more screenings, right? We do depression screenings, we do social determinants of health screenings, you know, particularly in the last year, We've worked a lot with our SDOH screenings, and it's really, really hard to get the team to, to engage and want to go through the screening right before the visit or through the portal or, or um, in other ways. So I can't even imagine how you add um, sleeping. Um, I think it's a great thing. I just um, wondering how you get engagement. Um, but it seems particularly important in the behavioral health integration uh, work we're doing. And I think, you know, in my mind, if I call my behavioral health integrated colleague who's with me to assist me with a patient, I'm hoping, and I'm going to go back and check that they're doing an assessment of the sleep pattern, right? That they're not forgetting that. Um, so a lot of work to be done. For yeah. Sure. Uh, and so I'm glad. So I, I think part of what we're doing in this moment is we're really highlighting and I'm excited that these are what was coming up because this is where we're going this year in the sleep series. And so, you know, 
the, the opportunity to really impact um, sleep health, whether it's a component of something like trauma or depression or anxiety or a pulmonary condition, or if it's worsening uh, management of something like diabetes or um, any other health condition, um, there's always this question. I think that's reflective of what we're talking about. Of, does this well? Is this the? Is this primary care's problem? Is this behavioral health's problem? Um, really, you know, is our problem if it's our patient's problem, right? But um, how do we? How to actually kind of um, divide up the responsibilities and then work together at the same time with a shared kind of understanding of, of our patients' needs and goals and, and bringing them into the process? You know, it, it is complicated. Um, uh, you know, I'll share from my from some of my, and that's what we'll be talking about as we talk about behavioral health screening and treatment, as well as medical screening and treatment. You know, some of I think some of what we often see as key opportunity areas is around medication, and, I'm, and I'm, I'd love to hear um, from our panelists in terms of you know how sleep related medication comes up and and what that looks like. Um, I'll share from some of my experiences in primary care. Um, you know, medications say uh, like Ambien or uh, an anxiolytic medication like uh, say Ativan or Xanax, um, sometimes were requested by our patients or, or um, you know, seemed indicated, but there was hesitance because we know of some of the substance use and, and behavioral implications and just health concerns. And so then patients would get routed to me as the behavioral health provider in primary care and they say, okay, figure out, is this what this person really needs? Is there something else to do for them? Um, does that come up in your health centers? Like, are there certain things that tend to like trigger uh, an event for like bringing in a member of the integrated care team? So for us, um, it could be any, it could be anything. Um, controlled substances, which is what you're talking about, is a particular challenge um, and behavioral health automatically gets involved with that because we want to explore exactly what's going on with the patient. Is this a patient who needs a psychiatric evaluation? Um, is it a trauma related situation? You know, what exactly is going on that may be um, feeding the difficulty with sleep and controlled substances? We're really trying to work through um, some steps to um, integrate if it's needed with the controlled substance because the controlled substance isn't the end all be all. Um, and we have to help clients figure out alternative methods, whether it's, you know, going through sleep hygiene or, a variety of other things to use in combination or instead of uh, a lot of the prescribed medicines because eventually they stop working and we're back to square one. Um, so it's about infusing a lot of behavioral health techniques as well. Well, I just have to say I'm very envious of the model that Lee is, is working in and the, the integration that you have. Um, I, I think I get brought in mostly when um, all those things have stopped working and um, or there's self-medicating that's happening. Then that's when I get brought in. And I know in the chat someone had mentioned um, marijuana being used for sleep and some self-medicating that, you know, and I, I do see a lot of that. Um, it's not legal in Idaho, but we're pretty close to the border. so. You know, dealing with all of those issues too. Um, but that's most of the time when I am brought in. And um, a lot of people also are very adverse to wanting any medication. You know, they, they either try something or they just don't want to take medication. And so then um, when the provider kind of is at a loss of what else to provide, um, that's when I get involved. And I would just add, um, you know, if we all come with the assumption that um, sleep disturbances are telling us something else, you know, I want to find something else. I don't want to just make people sleepy. I want to know if there's anxiety behind it. I want to know if there's depression behind it. I want to know if somebody's hurting them. I, you know, so, so I feel as an internist, I feel not just ill equipped to to diagnose sometimes what's happening, but also ill-equipped to solve their problem because you know I'd like to get to the root cause. And that sometimes means the patient going home without anything, without medications, and feeling like they're not, you know, that we didn't address their symptoms. Um, and and with our, I'm sure you know you'll all agree that some of the medications that that may work 
pretty quickly to get people to sleep um, have risks, particularly in the elderly, right? So no one wants to cause a hip fracture because they gave benzos or, you know, Ambien to somebody um, who lives alone and has never had sleep medicine. So uh, it is catch-22. Yeah, and I know, you know, I think it's, um, in, in some ways, talking about sleep can be pretty frustrating because for those exact reasons, I think, because, um, you know, I, on both ends, I think from a behavioral, purely behavioral health perspective and from a purely medical perspective, um, we don't always have all the answers, right? And, and sort of like, you know, are there are there pretty good long-term medications that, that you know, solely really ad address something like insomnia, um, you know, sort of uh, kind of debatable. Um, we know that there's gold standard interventions when it comes to the case of something like cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which we'll talk about when we get to the behavioral interventions piece, but that's also difficult. Um, and sometimes it can be hard to keep our patients engaged in a longer course of treatment or in the case of integrated care, um, you know, when we move to more of like a primary care centric model, if we have like a, sometimes I'll see a patient for, you know, 15 or 20 minutes and that didn't always match the model that there's new evolutions of, of brief intervention. So I think it's, um, that's part of why we're having these discussions and, um, you know, I'm curious, so, so a big part of our panel um, and, and hearing from the audience today is to inform our year long series you know, um, hi, maybe we can bring back up our slide that has the topics on it, because I'd love to hear when we look at these topics, um, what do you want to hear most about? What are the things that are like, I see there's a, you know, I've seen a couple questions that come up around medication. Um, uh, Christina just mentioned, what was it? Do we use trazodone? Do we use melatonin? Uh, there's a lot of different questions that come up around melatonin and specifically um, and, and even controversy around that, uh, let alone when we put something like, like, like Ambien out there or other medic or medications that have sort of like um, um, sedating uh, side effects, um, you know, We've also, uh, Dr. Yuma, I think you mentioned in the chat as well. Um, we'll have that discussion around social determinants. Um, one of our audience members mentioned, you know, does bringing up social determinants and, and, and health equity um, actually change the visit or the reason for the visit or the nature of the care that we're providing? Um, so, you know, kind of thinking about our, our upcoming topics. So we have, uh, um, we'll have coming up uh, again, addressing sleep through uh, medical assessment and intervention. Um, and so that can include things like medication, um, but also uh, other physical manifestations of, of sleep issues like like uh, like uh, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, for example. We'll talk about behavioral health interventions and assessment. Um, but we're going to talk specifically about social determinants. We're going to talk about this issue of um, what are the key things that we can do for our own care teams. Um, uh, Christine is mentioning, let's talk about sleep hygiene. Yeah, I think we'll talk about that when we talk about behavioral interventions, but um, panelists, but also audience members, this is the moment. What, what frustrates you the most? What are you losing sleep over when it comes to addressing sleep? What, what do you wanna hear more about? If we could bring in the best experts possible, what, what, what would be most useful to hear about? I think I I would like to hear um, about I mean things that that tend to work. Um, I think the sleep hygiene um, I you know definitely review that. But like when you've exhausted some of those kinds of things, what else? What else do we do? Um, and um, and then medication, just kind of understanding those a little bit better, but also bringing in the aspects of self-medicating, um, specifically the THC and, and marijuana, you know, what, how does that really impact? There's, I struggle in finding a whole lot of studies out there that really, you know, help me know how to um, coach patients and how to work with them. Um, so I think taking good assessment and making sure that we're really strong on how to, once we've identified there is an issue, how do we dig deeper and ask the right questions? And then what are the things that we can be looking at for interventions? Um, and, um, and, and looking at some of the issues that have been brought up about culture and different populations and um, those other things that we might need to be aware of. 
Yeah, and we're getting a lot of activity in the chat as well, kind of uh, some some um, really specific areas. Uh, a couple of people have mentioned CP, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, um, but also like how do we adapt this, um, working with folks who may have um, brain injury. You know, we hear a lot about MTBI and like milder forms that are even more common. Uh, folks mentioning caffeine use, uh, group work, right? And so we know that this is something that you know, certainly has been deployed, um, uh, treatments have been deployed from group, um, both for things like um, obstructive sleep apnea, but also behavioral interventions for sleep. Um, folks mentioning uh, diabetic uh, uh, diabetic neuropathy and sleep, and, and Camille reminds me of what you mentioned earlier around pain and sleep and this intersectionality there. Um, we see that as huge, right? We know when sleep is worse, pain is worse. When pain is worse, you know, surprise, sleep tends to be worse too. Um, and what other people mentioned here, um, some specific interventions around sleep apnea. Yeah, you know, I am curious from the audience, uh, you know, for those of you who are primarily behavioral health providers, do you assist in screening for sleep apnea? Um, I think someone mentioned essentially what I think is the stop uh, screener, but is that something that you're doing? Is that something that you'd like to hear more about? The other thing, Andrew, is as we've started to use EMDR and resourcing, um, which will address a lot of the issues um, simultaneously. And it's really easy to do in about 15 or 20 minutes. And um, people are finding it very successful. So um, that's, I would like to know more about that. Um, is there specific protocols for EMDR? Are there different ways to do it that are 15, 20 minutes that are brief interventions that don't require the commitment of long-term cognitive behavioral interventions? Yeah, I think that's going to be key as well. So what are the things that we can do, especially for those of us that don't necessarily have, um, you know, patients that we see regularly, like, you know, week after week or something like that, you know, when we have someone maybe, you know, just for a couple of visits or even one visit, what's the best valuable thing that you can do? Um, you know, Tara in the chat is mentioning, you know, working with our, with our patients who are sometimes a little stuck or, you know, feel like, you know, we have those like catastrophizing things that we talk about in cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, my sleep is killing me, um, you know, I can never fall asleep. And, and we know that the experience of sleep itself um, can be anxiety provoking, can be, um, you know, um, you know, certainly um, reminiscent of, or remind us of traumas that we've been through and things. So sleep can be, it's so complicated. Um, uh, we've got Latanya mentioning hormonal changes uh, related to sleep and pain, um, getting buy-in for behavioral interventions. Well, when our patients, and actually I'll, I'll add in when our providers also just want medication, right? We feel this, I think all of us who are in a, any sort of healthcare um, like staff role, we feel a pressure to sort of provide something at a visit, um, whether it's medication or like a list of strategies or something. And to Dr. Amir's point, sometimes it's not so, it's not always so clear and easy. It's not something that is, um, we can sort of solve right there in the moment. And that's a ton of pressure that we feel, I think. Um, uh, Christina mentioned mindfulness. So we'll definitely have some discussion on mindfulness. Um, yeah, a lot of comments coming around pain and sleep, uh, substance use disorders and sleep disturbance. Lee, I know you mentioned this a lot and a few of us have mentioned uh, like MAT and, and even how things like that, um, um, when we're looking at trying to address, for example, opioid use disorders, right? So what a focus we've had. Uh, um, and yet, you know, again, this is one more area for um, that can add struggles to that. Um, got folks in the audience sharing their own um, interest in, in trying to get a good night's sleep. Um, nutrition and metabolism. Yeah, we had some interesting discussions last year in our diabetes series around nutrition. I think that there's definitely a, a role here. Um, Postmenopausal women, uh, poor quality sleep. Um, yeah, links to other health conditions. Um, caffeine usage, yeah. Um, the other thing that I'll just mention, I'm curious uh, if uh, folks in the audience or, or also our panelists um, see this, particularly when we're talking about healthcare workers ourselves, um, um, issues related to shift work, uh, like when you're working the overnight shift, you know, where I think all of us are really keyed in right now to improving access to care. Sometimes that means, you know, having our staff work evenings, weekends, kind of some um, less like traditional nine to five hours um, has that impact ourselves, but also, our patients and we have many populations who are and individuals who are working multiple jobs right now. Um. Well, Andrew, you are not, you know, there's plenty of talk yeah. here. I think there's 
there's a lot of uh, things we could talk. I mean, I think the social media piece and the fact that we're all on screens until so late at night, and then we turn on a different screen to watch the news or something, um, you know, it doesn't help us. It doesn't help the children either. Yeah. Yeah, and so we're in our final minutes, but um, uh, but uh, also Lee and Camille, any other kind of things that you'd love to see us do as we move forward, um, listening to what the audience has been mentioning here and also our own discussion, um, what seems important? For, for me, I I'm sorry, Camille. Go ahead. For me, I, I think it's I think it's being able to figure out what's going on with the patient and then adapting the intervention to the patient's needs. What are they going to do? What are they willing to do? What are they capable of doing? And I think having a full toolbox of a variety of different things is going to be very helpful. That way you can tailor it to what, what the patient's capabilities and interest is. Yeah, and I just kind of play off what you were saying. What I was going to say is that I think we have to recognize that many times we, our own lives and our patient's lives are not an ideal situation. So how do we help them given the things that, that, you know, we are dealing with, the things like shift work and, you know, just the, the changes that we're experiencing. Um, we can give them that list of sleep hygiene and we can talk about those things, but sometimes it's just not realistic. So how do we create a plan that's specific for each patient that can be realistic? Yeah, so so this is what we're going to do. We're going to, I think this year, what we'll be focusing on is, is, is getting real about sleep. And, and so we're talking about what are the limitations of what we can do? Um, what are the impacts of our own experiences, you know, as healthcare providers? Um, how, do, how does what's going on in our communities impact sleep and the recommendations that we're making to our patients and what can we all do? And so I know we're, we're at the end of our time. Um, I want to thank each of our panelists uh, for joining us today and for taking this time for sharing the experiences that you're having, also what your what your staff and what your you know your your populations are struggling with, um, and and feeding us this information. This is what we're going to use to really inform this year. Um, folks can head over. You'll be able to review a recording of today's discussion, but also sign up for our topical webinars where we're going to provide concrete information, resources, and tools on the topics that we talked about today, um, and more with our first session starting uh, December third. Um, so I just want to thank everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll we'll see you hopefully back. Uh, in December as we get into what is sleep and the basics of sleep. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much.